We love to love. You could go so far as to suggest that we live to love. Whether by design or instinct, it is our desire to put something at the center of our adoration and our affection, either something or someone. Is it part of the human condition and it's a curse? Or is it part of our human nature and it's a blessing? You could suggest that it's what makes us human and humane. The direction of our affection, let's call it worship, will be directly related to our view of the origins of the universe. Here are your options. There was nothing, and then there was everything. There was no life, and then life. And while it was a cosmic accident, it is certainly worthy of our wonder and maybe even our worship. Or there was God, and God created everything from nothing. And as a result, God pre-existed and will exist far after this existence comes to an end. And if God, then he alone is worthy of worship. And so let's break these two down because the reality is your view of the origins of the universe, your view of non-God's existence or God's existence will not only affect your, the direction of your worship, but your worship and how it implies itself into every aspect of your life. First option, nothing. In the beginning, nothing, which then formed into everything. Here's how it must have worked. Nothing. And then suddenly and unexplainably, with no reason or purpose or direction, everything suddenly erupted. Light. Light and energy shot out in a massive explosion. And as it exploded, it exploded at, and began to expand. And we can measure the rate of its expansion. And its rate of expansion is so precise, so perfect, that the universe is expanding at such a speed that it will not implode in on itself. But also at such a speed that matter can still form. And so energy begins to take shape. Molecules begin to form. First, right, you could say subatomic particles begin to form into atoms. Atoms begin to take on shape and begin to form into molecular structure. Molecules begin to form and matter as we see it begins to take shape. Masses, great masses begin to form. Galaxies take shape. Solar systems take shape. Stars and planets take shape. Everything, all celestial beings begin to take shape and fill the expanse of the universe that first existed as only energy and radiation on one particular planet and possibly only one planet in all of the great universe. All of these molecules that gathered began to form into more complex structures. We call them amino acids. Amino acids, which are the building blocks of life's existence. These amino, amino acids began to form together into protein structures. Incredibly complex structures. So complex that they make a Rolex look like a round circle. Like, you know, meaning just an object. They make Rolex watches look simple. That's how complex a protein structure is. But let's not stop there. These protein structures formed together, complemented each other, and suddenly, unexplainably, and with no rhyme or reason, came together to form all of the necessary building blocks of the most simple life form. If you were to imagine the most simple life form on earth, in order for that simple life form to exist, all of these various, very complex protein structures had to suddenly gather together and instantly form every aspect of a cell. Cell membrane, mitochondria, DNA, RNA, all of the various elements that make up the most simple life form had to suddenly come together precisely and perfectly to make up all of the varying parts of a cell and then all attach themselves into the exact design so that even the most simple life form could exist as an inanimate object. But then, 
Again, unexplainably, and with no rhyme or reason, that inanimate object that suddenly and instantly formed also suddenly and instantly came to life. And not only came to life, but had the capacity to begin to reproduce itself. Let's just stop right there. Because I might have already missed some of you. And I don't want to. So there is this idea within the origins of the universe, science, called the, you know, the basic laws of probability. So this is how math intersects with the origins, right? So imagine you have a coin and you're going to flip it. There's a 50-50 chance or probability that it will land on heads. Some of you have done this, right? You can take a coin and flip it and 50-50 chance. And then you can flick it again. There's another 50-50 chance it will land on its heads or tails. So imagine that same idea of how molecules exist and take shape. Now, let's not even start there because it would be mind-blowing if we start just at the molecular level. So let's start at the amino acid level. In order for amino acids to form into protein structures that would then form into the most simple life form that exists on earth today, here is basically the best picture I can give you. Imagine taking apart all of the parts of a 747 jumbo jet. Let's say a million parts. And then let's cut all of those parts into little jig jigsaw puzzle pieces. Each piece, a thousand, each, each part of the plane, a thousand little pieces. You with me so far? All right, now you've got a thousand jigsaw pieces making up each part of the 747 plane. You have a million parts to the plane. And then let's just scatter them over a junkyard. And then we're going we're gonna to miraculously, but unexplainably, and by accident, send a tornado through the junkyard. A tornado that is going to pick up all of those pieces and begin to swirl them around. All right? Now, over here in the tornado, as it's spinning, the, the force of a welding, right, a welding torch is going to begin to cause certain metals to come together to take shape and form exactly the part of all those thousand-piece puzzles coming together to make up that piece of the plane. And the, uh, the heat within the tornado is going to cause a welding sensation to occur to cause them to come together. Over here, as this part of the tornado is spinning, all of the components of this particular electronic piece that makes up, I don't know, the dashboard of the plane is going to begin to work to cause wiring to come together and that part to then take shape so that as it's swirling within the tornado, the thousand piece puzzle of that part is going to form. Now, all, one, all of these one million thousand piece puzzles have to come together perfectly. Then at the same time, the tornado is going to spit them out. And before one part hits the ground, all of them are going to form together to create a perfect, not one part out of place, 747 jumbo jet that before it hits the ground actually takes off and flies. Hey, hey, hey hold up. I did not tell you that illustration to make fun or poke fun. There are things about the creation account that are kind of absurd. That kind of make you go, huh? But here's the point. Very often, people who believe in God, who start with the option of God's existence, get pointed at and maybe made a little fun of. You believe in that? And we would say, yes, really. And I would challenge you that I don't know that I have enough faith to believe that nothing became everything and 747s began to fly out of junkyards hit by tornadoes. I struggle with that. I, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm simply saying my faith quotient isn't high enough for me to believe that. It doesn't make it right or wrong. It just means that you have to have faith to believe that a tornado can hit a junkyard. Now, Obviously, worked into the equation is the fact that all of the parts to form the 747 already existed. That's the whole idea of amino. If we start only with amino acids already existing, now they have to form suddenly life from inanimate life. Here is one of the authors, a, a great a, a, a scientist, William Stokes, who wrote as an American geologist who wrote the book Essentials of Earth History, and he wrote regarding this probability. 
The probability is so small that it would not occur during billions of years on billions of planets, each covered by a blanket of concentrated watery solution of the necessary amino acids. Meaning if you took all of the necessary parts of life and you covered billions of planets over billions of years, the probability that they would all form together to create even one of the most simple life forms that exist on earth, it is absolutely improbable. It's mathematically impossible. Am I making fun? Am I pointing fun? Not at all. I am simply suggesting that you have to accept that option by faith. And as a result, by faith, you are believing that nothing became everything, non-life became life, and here's how it implies itself onto your life. Your life came from nothing. Therefore, there is no purpose. There is no meaning. There is no significance. There is no value. There is no justice. There is no truth. So you can do what you want without consequence whenever you want for as often as you want until you don't want to anymore. Your desires and wants reign supreme. In essence, you are God and you can worship yourself or you can worship anything or whatever you want because it's all meaningless. Now that also raises a question that C.S. Lewis more profoundly addressed than I possibly could. C.S. Lewis said, if the whole universe has no meaning, we should never have found out that it has no meaning. Just as if there were no light in the universe and therefore no creatures with eyes, we should never know it was dark. Dark would be without meaning. Again, in no way suggesting to make fun or poke fun at, just presenting some challenges with this option. However, if this is your option, then certainly the world as it exists is incredible and wonderful and worthy of worship, worthy of your undying devotion, your blind faith. Blind faith as I feel best written by Richard Dawkins, the leading atheist who wrote about his view of how we should approach the world since it came into existence as a cosmic accident. In his book, The God Delusion, he is writing about his affection, adoration, call it worship, of the existing world. He writes, the evolution of complex life, indeed its very existence in a universe obeying physical laws, is wonderfully surprising worthy of worship, or would be for the fact that surprise is an emotion that can exist only in a brain, which is the product of that very surprising process. It would certainly be worthy of worship, except that you are the product of it, and any worship you would ascribe to it came from a brain created by the worship, and so your brain is equally worthy of worship. And therefore, if it's all accidental, it's worthy of no worship at all. Think about it. On one planet, and possibly only one planet in the entire universe, molecules that would normally make nothing more complicated than a chunk of rock gather themselves together into chunks of rock-sized matter of such staggering complexity that they are capable of running, jumping, swimming, flying, seeing, hearing, capturing, and eating other such animated chunks of complexity. Capable in some cases of thinking and feeling and falling in love with yet other chunks of complex matter. You would think that Richard Dawkins was pointing fun or poking fun, but not at all. He's saying, this is what I fundamentally believe. And so it's no wonder that throughout history, various peoples ascribed worship to what exists. The Egyptians worshiped above all other gods, the sun god. Muhammad in his worship, as he went to worship all the various different gods of his religious tradition, put his focus and his affection and adoration on the moon god Allah above all other gods, and then eventually ruled that Allah, the moon god, was better than all of the rest, and eventually said Allah reigns supreme as creator. The moon god is the, the god. Then you have pantheists who believe in worshiping Mother Earth, because earth is wonderful and incredible and worthy of our worship. And then there's us, who don't live or worship like that, do we? No, we just put at the center of our adoration and our affection ourselves, our desires, our habits or hobbies, or someone. We love a person or a pet. 
We put somebody, a spouse or somebody you hope that will be your spouse, at the center of your affection and you worship them. Oh, we're not all that different from the Egyptians, from Muhammad, from pantheists who worship Mother Earth. Because if there is nothing that becomes everything and will eventually go back to nothingness, then you can worship whatever you want because it's all meaningless anyway. However, there, are, there is not unanimity among the scientific community that all of science lands on the side of nothingness becoming everything and non-life becoming life. No, in fact, Robert Jastrow, astronomer, physicist, and the founder of NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies, wrote this. Astronomers now find that they have painted themselves into a corner because they have proven by their own methods that the world began abruptly in an act of creation, creation of nothing into everything, to which you can trace the seeds of every star, every planet, every living thing in this cosmos and on earth. And they have found that all of this happened as a product of forces they cannot hope to discover that there are what I and anyone would call supernatural forces at work is now, I think, scientifically proven fact. So where does this leave us? It leaves us with the second option. As recorded in the Bible, a book 66 different smaller books captured together in two volumes called the Old and the New Testament, the, the story of how God wrote himself into the history of the universe, in the history of our planet, into the history of mankind, and into the history of every living being. So let's go to the Bible and discover what God says about the origins Genesis chapter 1. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. The name Genesis means beginnings. And so let's jump in to the first book of the Bible, the beginnings, and what it says about the origins. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I thought we would just take this apart. Remember, the Bible was first written in the Old Testament, written in Hebrew, a language of the Jewish people. And so to really understand what's going on, even in this first verse, you have to understand the Hebrew language. And so it says, in the beginning, which, which is kind of a bookend statement. So it's kind of like saying the first chapter, which immediately makes your mind jump to the conclusion that there would be a last chapter. In the beginning of the story, meaning when we start the story of the universe, in the beginning, you have to jump ahead and your mind immediately races to the fact that then there must be an end to the story. Which interestingly, science also suggests, scientific research says, that all of this is on its way to an end. Everything is going to eventually be destroyed. Good, because that's how the story of God opens. In the beginning, implying an end, God. Elohim pre-existed. He was before all things and will exist after all things. Elohim, which is the Hebrew name for God who reigns supreme, the uncreated, self-existent creator of all things who is knowable. Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God who reigns and creates by his own will and by his own desires. God created the heavens and the earth, everything. He spoke into nothingness, everything. And here is where that leads us. Here is where that lands. You believe, if you're anything like me, that over here is us, a bunch of people who by faith just believe Genesis 1.1. And then there's all these scientists who are brilliant thinkers who've done all the research and they have all the facts on their side. And then we hope that guys like Ken Ham come along, Creation Science Museum, and they prove, they discover other facts to disprove what these guys over here believe. And so we are blindly believing the Bible and they have all the scientific evidence and we over here just kind of wish they were wrong. But that's not how it works at all. In fact, here is what research suggests today. There's a leading scientist, John Iannone, out of Stanford University, who's done a significant amount of research over the last decade, who has discovered and proven his research is on the fact that there's a lot of bad research out there. 
That's how he spends his life, disproving a lot of scientific studies. And he has come to the conclusion that between 60 and 91% of all medical research is false. And it's either starts out false or is proven false. His point is simply this. You should be skeptical of scientific research. Here are the reasons why he says much of the the medical research is wrong or eventually proven wrong because it started from a position of bias or prejudice. The, The scientific researcher has an agenda and sets up the research in such a way that he gets the desired outcome. You you remember the the popular quote, 78% of statistics are just made up on the spot. You'll get it. So that's his point. People create statistics to prove their point. They create studies and research to defend their position. Other reasons, there's financial agendas, there's financial pressure, there's political pressure, there's too limited of a scope of research and so the study is so small that its outcome is by virtue of the way it began going to fail and be unable to be replicated. Okay, where does that leave us? It simply leaves us at a position where we understand that facts are open for interpretation. It's not so much the facts that are at question, but how you interpret the facts, how you read the research and the conclusions you draw. So on one side, you could read the exact same set of facts about the origins of the universe, and because of your bias that there is no God, come to the conclusion that nothingness became everything and will eventually return to nothingness. Or you can look at it through the lens that God pre-exists all things and created all things. On one side, you will worship something or someone. You'll make yourself or something else out to be God. And you will live life worshiping and loving whatever you want. And your life will be empty and meaningless. Or what? Or you will discover the meaning and the purpose of life itself. And it would be this. That you and I were made and live to worship. That you were actually created by design for the express purpose of living your life to worship. However, as you go down this road, you would quickly discover that there is a sabotaging work alive inside of you and at work in the world around you called sin. That sin from the very first man and woman corrupted their worship, robbed them of focusing their worship on God, making themselves out to believe that they are gods deserving of their own worship. And as a result, began to put their worship onto other somethings and someones. But every time they worshiped something other than God, they destroyed it because they eventually needed a new thing to worship. And when they worshiped someone, either themselves or someone else, they discovered that that worship corrupted themselves and others because they set up an expectation that was impossible to meet. When you worship someone or something else, it always leaves you disappointed because you're going to need a new thing or a new someone because nothing and no one is capable of handling the level of worship you desire to put on it. Sin cuts us off from relationship with God. It's a spiritual curse that sabotages our worship of God, separating us from God and leaving us on a life trajectory toward forever destruction. Sin corrupts and sabotages our thinking, our desires, our worship, leaving us separated from God, making us out to believe that we are worthy or something else is worthy of worship and all of that worship does is ruins us and the world we live in. But God, unwilling to leave us in this mess, intervened in our story. The Apostle Paul, this guy who went from being a guy who killed Christians to having a revelation of Jesus and eventually became a Christian. He used his business to fund starting churches all around the world. He started, he, he started these churches and then would help resource them and he would write letters to them. However, he had a desire to go to Rome and there was already a church in Rome. So he wanted to pastor them and so he wrote a letter to them. And in his letter, he described this crazy shift of how people go from worshiping God to worshiping stuff. In Romans chapter 1, verse 21, he wrote this. For although they, meaning mankind, that's us, knew God, they 
we neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, meaning silly, empty, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images made to look like mortal man, birds and animals and reptiles. Basically, he is saying that because of sin corrupting our hearts, every one of us by instinct will shift our worship from God who's deserving to someone or something else that will be destroyed by the very worship we place on it. But God, unwilling to leave us in this state of sin corruption, where sin is corrupting us, our relationships, and the world around us, he intervened in our story by becoming one of us. So that in order for you to discover that you were made and lived to worship, you have to take this step first. And that is you and I must be remade by Jesus. How? God in order to rescue us from the corruption of sin entered into our world. Jesus Christ comes to earth in the fullness of God. He takes on our sin, our death, and our eternal judgment. So that the Apostle Paul, in another letter he wrote to the church, he started in Colossae. He wrote, and it's recorded in the Bible called Colossians, the letter of Paul to the church in Colossae. He writes in verse, chapter 1, verse 19, for God was pleased to have all of, the full, of his fullness dwell in him, in Jesus, and through him to rec reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Okay, that was a mouthful. Let me break it down for you. God, desiring to rescue people from the consequence of sin, intervened by becoming one of us. Jesus Christ, in his death on the cross, he died for all of us. He took the collective eternal death sentence on himself. His death, our death. His judgment, the payment we deserve for sin. So that when he died, he reconciled man to God. So that anyone who believes in Jesus Christ by faith is forgiven of their sins. Reunited in relationship with God because God's spirit, which is eternal and invisible, enters into our spirit, which is eternal and invisible. And when God's spirit enters into our spirit, we experience a resurrection. We become truly alive. And we are given the gift of eternal life. With God's spirit reunited with our spirit, we are remade in Jesus Christ overcoming the corrupting force of sin so that we can then discover how we can live a life of worship. We can reclaim our original created destiny of worship. As we begin to rediscover our destiny, we are given a mission. And that is what the conclusion of that verse in Colossians chapter 1 verse 19, that God is at work redeeming all creation. When you believe in Jesus by faith, you are given a mission to counteract the work of sin in the world around you. You are the agent of change in your world counteracting sin through the work of Jesus, your Savior. Now, what does that look like? It means this. That means you were made to worship. That's right. Everything was made to worship. Buckle up. I'm going to push in pretty deep, pretty quickly, all right? I have tremendous confidence in each of you who take time to listen to me preach, and so I'm going to move pretty quickly. I'm going to try to break this down and keep it simple enough for you to, for you to follow along. I mean, I, I respect you, so you're going to stay with me. Here it is. Let me first go back and read Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, right? Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then we're just going to jump right in to verse 2. Now, the earth was formless and empty, right? He already starts with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So now the earth is formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. The spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now he's gonna go back and tell us how we got there. Verse three, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. And he called the light day and darkness. He called night. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Now we're gonna get into, through Genesis chapter one, the entire account of God's creation. And there, it's interesting because as you read it, there's a powerful form to how God, there's an order to the sequence of how God created. So let me speak a couple things important for you to apply to your life. First, God spoke into nothingness everything. Follow me. Even nothingness worships God when it obeys. 
that's powerful for your life. Because some of you have been in a position where you felt like you had nothing to give. Like there is nothing inside of you. Your faith is empty. And all you got to do is respond in worship through obedience and nothingness can take shape and become what God destined for it to become. God can take the empty lack of faith in your life and speak into that nothingness, destiny, and purpose, and meaning, and significance. God can speak into your marriage where there is something, there is nothingness at work that's destroying your home, that's deteriorating your workplace, that's killing your community. And God can speak into that nothingness Nothingness, as you respond in worship and obedience, nothingness can become everything. And your only response, worship and obedience. Interestingly, let's go back to the creation order. Here's what God does. Here's how you read it. Because you got to remember, this was written in Hebrew. There's a poetic way that they write. So here's, here's how it records the creation. God formed and then he filled. God formed day and night. And then he filled it with the sun, the moon, the stars. That's day four. Day two, God formed the sky and the waters. Day five, he filled it with birds and creatures that live in the waters. Day three, he created land. Day six, he filled it with the creatures that live on the land, including mankind. All right, you follow the form and the filled? The point is, everything exists for the worship of God. So even science is a process of uncovering the glory of God and how God worked to create all things. Every time you read a science book, you should be in a moment of worship. You should be sitting in physics class going, wow, God! You should be sitting in bio class going, only God! Chemistry class, yes, God, not praying. I don't mean like, oh, God, help me. I mean, I mean the fact that God followed an order to creation and everything is exactly as you would imagine it to be if the Genesis account is true. Light, energy that suddenly comes into existence that begins to form things. And then over time, it begins to be filled with living things. Pretty incredible, right? Now, there's another part to this whole creation thing. All science agrees that there's a corruption at work in the world we live in. DNA is breaking down. Genetics are deteriorating and decaying. Everything is headed toward destruction. So you call it microevolution, that you could start with a super species that evolves over time into subspecies or what we call simply species. So there was some super horse that over time evolved into a zebra and a donkey and a horse, right? We agree with that. It's provable. It's repeatable. Well, I don't know about repeatable, but it's at least they can prove it, right? We agree. We we agree that um, DNA breaks down and as you lose information, creatures become more specialized. What we can't do is prove that mutation adds new information. It only deteriorates. Okay, I'm going somewhere with this. God, when he created light, he said it is good. He created it good. Sin corrupts and sin is breaking everything down and crying out for the need of a savior. Creation is worshiping God even in its decay, saying, I need help. Every death, every decay, every star that explodes, every element of creation that is deteriorating and decaying is saying, sin is corrupting us and we need help. And God is saying, help is on the way, which then leads to how you respond. In Romans chapter 11, verse 36, the apostle Paul wrote, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Which means we live to worship. You were created to worship. You were remade by Jesus to worship. And now you wake up every day because you were created from God, for God, and through God you live every day of your life. Here, here, follow me. Every atomic structure 
that makes up every molecule, that makes up every amino acid, that makes up every protein, that makes up every cell is declaring God's glory. By its design, it is proclaiming that there is a designer God who is holding everything together. Every single thing that exists on earth and in the universe is actually proclaiming and declaring the glory of God whether it knows it or not. So how do you live? Well, let's just make this really practical. You want to live to worship God? Then you and I have a responsibility to experience to focus our attention on God. That's worship. That means when you see a sunrise or a beautiful sunset and you go, wow, you focus your attention on the God who created the world that allows a sunrise or sunset to come into existence. Then when you, when you focus your attention, you begin to express your affection. God, I love you. Wow. Look at who you are. Scientists should be, look, this is where science actually came from. Christians who wanted to study creation. And as they studied, they went, wow, God, only you could do this. This is amazing. Expressing our affection to God and then finally using our abilities for God. That means if I existed by the design of God for the express purpose of worshiping God, then everything I do and everything I am should be used, my abilities to worship God. Am I living my life every day using my abilities for God's purposes? The way I think, the way I act, my personality, my giftedness, my ability to earn money, my ability to relate to people, my inabilities, my weaknesses, my failures, all of it to worship God. Now, let's land this by you and I responding. First, some, you've been living your life believing that there was nothing, then everything, and then eventually there'll be nothing. And it's left you wandering and wondering, worshiping something and someone other than God. And today you're saying, I believe in Jesus Christ, and I want to turn my focus from worshiping myself and other things to Jesus. I believe in Jesus by faith. And if that's where you're at today, I would invite you to make that your decision and your confession. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you died. I believe that you rose again. And I want to give you worship. And if that's where you're at today, I invite you to take that step of faith to make that your confession. Invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior. And before you go, you let somebody know. I'm inviting you to that step. Fill out that envelope. Let somebody know online. If you're watching this, just let somebody know. Talk to one of our pastors who are available both online and at the Raise the Life banner before you leave today. And I encourage you to make that your prayer for each one of you. Are you living to worship God or are you living more like a Christian atheist? You say you believe in Jesus, but you're living worshiping other things. Today it's time to reconcile your heart with God and get the focus of your worship in the right direction because the direction of your worship is directly affected by your view of the origins. And if God, then meaning, and if meaning and purpose to your life, then your purpose of life is to worship God. Make sure you give him what he rightly deserves. And so I want to invite you to stand right now because this is going to be our response in worship. Don't let it all out here, meaning don't be like, all right, well, I sang, I worship, so I'm done. No, no, no. This is a beginning point. This is a launch point, all right? I want you to go from here and let this be a starting point. In fact, even the rest of the service, greeting other people, giving. It's not your money. It was given to you by design of God to give back. Do you give in worship? Do you love in worship? Do you serve in worship? Are you in community as an act of worship to God? Let me pray over you. Would you join me? Heavenly Father, thank you that you loved us so much that you came to earth to rescue us from the curse of sin, that you overcame the power of death and you set us free from eternal judgment. Today we confess Jesus Christ by faith. We believe in you as our Lord and Savior and we know that you rightly deserve all of our worship. Forgive us for putting worship on anything or anyone else. Now God, we return it all to you and we're going to begin to say, God, with everything we worship you. With everything we're going to shout for your glory with everything God we're going to declare that you are God and you are good in Jesus name amen we hope that you have enjoyed today's experience 
We also hope that this message has challenged you and will encourage you in the upcoming week. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ today, congratulations, welcome to the family, and welcome home. One of the most important first steps that you can take is by letting us know. You can click the prayer tab, or you can visit us at lifehousechurch.org. And if this message or ministry has blessed you in any way, feel free to partner with us financially. You can click on the Give tab, or you can visit our website and click Give. We are so thankful that you joined us, and we are thankful that you are part of our extended family. We can't wait to see you back here next week.